Welcome to the virtual campfire. My name is Sydney Williams, author and founder of Hiking My Feelings, and I'm so glad that you're here. The virtual campfire started as a replacement for what we were missing on the trail during the pandemic in 2020. We wanted to be sharing stories and listening to music and having conversations about hard topics at the end of a long day, shared in some of the most beautiful places in the world. In the absence of that, the virtual campfire was born and 50 something episodes later, we're still here. And this season, we're doing things a little bit differently. Over the course of the next few episodes, we're going to be sharing stories from people who have been through our 12 week online program called Blaze Your Own Trail to Self Love. Now, if you've been watching the virtual campfire or listening to the podcast from the beginning, you'll know that this program was launched after our initial 20 episodes of the virtual campfire. This program took everything that we had planned to do on the road in 2020 on my book tour through the US and Canada, workshops, retreats, overnights, group hikes, all of those things, and put them into a 12 week program that was available online so we could stay connected during the pandemic. Now we are getting ready to start our fourth class of this program on August 21st, and we couldn't think of a better way to get people hyped up about it, bring awareness to what we're doing, and share the stories of how this program has impacted real human lives than to bring on some of the people that have been through the program themselves. So I hope you have a nice, comfortable seat. I hope you have a beverage of choice, maybe a cozy blanket, maybe a journal. You never know what you're gonna hear that you might wanna jot down. So have a seat, sit back, relax, unless you're driving, then <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. But we hope you enjoy the virtual campfire. Thank you so much for being here. I have Victoria here and we are going to talk about her life, how she got onto the Pacific Crest Trail, why she wants to hike from Canada or Mexico to Canada and what she's doing here and where she wants to go. So Victoria, hi, welcome back to the virtual campfire. Hello. <laughs> Yay. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been a minute. We uh we had you on the original season. You were part of like the first 20 night thing. And I'm just so excited to have you back. So um for everybody who might not know you if they've been living under a rock or they're not on Instagram or like following your epic journey into the wilderness, <laughs> um, who is Victoria and where are you from? And then any other kind of like introductory kind of stuff you want to you want to share. Hello, I'm Victoria. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, um, born and raised in the greater Boston area. Um, moved out to Colorado in 2017, was living there for a couple of years, and then ended up moving back to Mass in 2019. Um, I run a, an Instagram account and YouTube channel, even though I haven't posted much lately on YouTube, um, called Plus Size Outdoors. It's an uh, it's a platform that is for anyone who has kind of been othered in the outdoors, um, who just wants to see themselves represented because the outdoors are for everyone and everybody. So, yeah. Heck yeah. And so we met at the Westminster REI store. Yeah, yes. Westminster. Yes. Yeah. So, so in 2019, um, and I think I shared this story when I made your original introduction two years ago when we started this podcast, but um, Victoria and I met at the Westminster Colorado REI store and I was sharing the story of how hiking helped me heal my mind and body, which then went on to develop into gestures broadly, all the things that are now hiking my feelings. <laughs> and we had a moment in the room and um, that's actually where I also met Laura Bingaman, who was the woman who bought my first, or was the first person to buy my book. Um, but Victoria and I just kind of locked eyes and it was one of those things where we were like, okay, we're going to cry. That's how this is going to go. And life is going to be good. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's funny is like, so I first heard about like your story and whatnot on the She Explores podcast and I was listening to it and I was like, it was the first time that I had ever really heard a story similar to mine reflected back to me. And I'm just ugly crying, sobbing. 
And it's just, it started a, a lot for me. Um, and then I reached out to How Can My Feelings on Instagram. And I was like, there's no way that it's like, I'm going to get a response, whatever. I just want to say thank you for everything. And like two days later, you wrote back, wrote back. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then when I saw, uh, met you at the REI in Westminster, I, I barely got three words out of my mouth. And I just started sobbing. It was just this release. And it, <laughs> it's like, and it felt so, so good. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> it was not strange in fact you we went so we had like we you know required the sweet green vest at REI to mop up the room I was speaking in after we got done crying <laughs> and then we went outside and we shut down the parking lot like we were tailgating at a football game or something just sitting there crying sharing stories talking about dreams um and I don't remember if you told me about your desire to through hike back then, or if that came to be knowledge that you shared with me later, but I'd love to hear about how you got into hiking and what eventually led you to the Pacific Crest Trail. And if this is your, you know, your big monologue, like I'm just here to listen. So take as much time as you want, tell the long version of the story, we got time. So I'm excited to hear it. Okay, so I'm gonna start. Okay, so I had gone to college and like, wanted to go into counters and intelligence like the whole stereotypical government employee that lives for their job like that was a life that i had kind of expected um but doors just never opened for me um so in like 2015 i just felt stagnant and stuck and i just needed i needed a change um so my family is not outdoorsy at all like the closest we ever got was the beach in the summer and that you know, somewhat of a stretch. So the, the fact that I woke up one day and was like, I want to go on a hike is as out of the blue as it comes. So <laughs> I, I reached out to a friend of mine who was like the only person that I knew who hiked at the time and said, Hey, I would like to go on a hike. Can, can we go? And she said, sure, pick a trail okay, so you're going to give the duty to picking a trail to someone who has no idea what they're doing. Great. <laughs> so I'm Googling trails in Mass, trails in New Hampshire. I am no idea what I'm doing. Um, ended up finding a trail um, near Lake Winnipesaukee, which is for those of you who don't know, it's one of the largest lakes in New Hampshire. Um, and it's kind of the foothills of the White Mountains, which are notoriously awful. Um, but this trail was about three miles and had about 1200 feet of elevation gain in the first mile. And I had no idea how to read a trail profile, but I'm like, it's pretty, let's go. And my friend's like, oh, are, are you sure? Okay, whatever. So long story short, we start this hike and I'm just like, what the fuck have I done? This is awful. Why do people do this? This is bullshit. And I'm just trying not to fall off this thing. And I'm just, not having a good time um and we get to the summit and it overlooks this lake and it's november so all the leaves have changed it's beautiful um and i was like oh, okay this is i can i can kind of start to understand this um and then we start the descent and we come across this stream which is too wide to step across too deep to kind of wade through but there's this log laying across it that has all these like broken branches and things just sticking up on it. And I was like, no, I am not setting foot on that because I am not graceful whatsoever. Um, and I'm like, I will trip on this, I'll impale, this is where I'm gonna die, I'm just not happening. Like I am just going through all of these like thoughts of this is, this is not, this, I'm not doing this. No way, no way, no way. And I'm at the point where I'm ready to walk through this stream in my mesh sneakers in November and just be like, if I die, I die. No big deal. Like, <laughs> so my friend literally takes my hand. She's like, okay, put one foot here, one foot here. And in two steps, I was across. And it's just my whole entire world just cracked open. And it was like, oh, I can do way more things than I think I can. And it's like, it just learned more stuff. I learned more about myself 
in those three miles than I had in the previous five years. And it just changed everything. And then like started to think like this fast paced life that I wanted living for my job was not really, you know, what I wanted. I wanted to be more grounded, more intentional with my life, go on adventures, live a life that I was proud of. So started like deep diving into learning about hiking and all this other stuff, stumbled across the PCT and I was just enthralled. Like the idea of walking for months at a time just latched onto my soul and uh, it just, it's been festering since. So, um, and then fast forward to 2019, I moved home to Massachusetts um, needed like a kind of a mental reset and I wanted to pay off some debt. So over the next couple of years, I paid off a lot of debt and kind of went through my own healing journey and just things aligned. And so this year I started the PCT. Let's talk a little bit about the healing journey. So we met in 2019. So that was April, 2019. Um, I love connecting dots. Mm -hmm. So I, I like putting dates on things. Um, so we're going to create like a yep. trail of life map for Sydney and Victoria's friendship. So we met April, 2019. It was a glorious moment. Tears were shed. Life was grand. And then some stuff happened, the pandemic, I wrote a book, you moved back home. And then we reconnected during our first class of Blaze Your Own Trail to Self-Love. So tell me about what brought you into that program. And are there any key takeaways that have resonated and that have impacted your life to this day, like that you use today? Um, so when COVID hit like March, 2020, I was supposed to go uh, to Florida to visit my cousin. Um, but it like right around the time that like people were unsure of what was happening. So I didn't want to fly to Florida and then get stuck here for an undetermined amount of time. Um, so I ended up canceling my trip, was home, for you know, a couple of weeks, which ended up turning into about six weeks. Um, and you know, I had your book on my shelf for you know a while at this point. Hadn't read it yet, so I'm like, yeah, I have nothing better to do. So when you read this book, so I'm like going through it, and like I remember texting you at key points and being like, I'm crying right now because of this sentence right here. And then like I got through the whole book, and I'm like, oh, that was really good. And then reading the epilogue of all things in your book. Uh, like the whole little section about like this is just my story but your story could be x y and z and I just like it unlocked something and I went into like a two-hour panic attack and was like hysterically crying for like six hours and then I started like journaling and journaling and journaling and like everything just came unlocked and I was like oh shit okay <laughs> that's a solid review yeah. of the book um, so for anybody who hasn't read it get to the epilogue, <laughs> have a two hour panic attack and sob hysterically for six hours. <laughs> Welcome to your best life. <laughs> but yeah, I love that uh -huh. because no, but it's true. And like, I think the important part to pull out of that, aside from the fact that like it elicited so much emotion and, and gave you so much to reflect on is that we're not alone. Like we have so much more in common than we are different. Like you were born East coast, you were born on the East coast. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Born on the East coast. I was born in Kansas. Yeah. Like I moved out to California. You were in Colorado. Like we've, we've kind of had similar migratory processes. We have had similar issues, like feeling deeply uncomfortable in our body. We've suffered some of the same traumas and ultimately like we have so mm -hmm. much more in common than people might assume if, if all they did was just look at us. And I think that that's a really important yeah. thing to pull out of that. So continue aside from, you know, so you just got done sobbing for six hours. Tell me more. Yeah. Yeah. It like, and then like, it just, I remember thinking like processing through the stuff that came up initially and being like, all oh, right, it's great. I'm healed now. Right. Like I'm going to go live my best life. It's, it's over. Yeah. I did it. And then like the realization of like, no, this is a forever journey. And I'm just like, ah, shit. So <laughs> I, I did it. I'm, I'm six. I read one book. I did three <laughs> hours of journaling. I cried for two hours and I'm fucking healed. Congratulations. I have I'll arrived. <laughs> the hallelujah chorus plays in the background. Yes. Oh, harps, harps. Yeah. 
<laughs> We've got harps and angels. <laughs> lights are twinkling. Your mind movies going in slow motion. You're like, this is me <laughs> running, healing, feeling great. All right, continue. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, so how I ended up in Blaze Your Own Trail, I, I really don't remember. I just remember, like, you talking about it. I'm like, no, that sounds good. And, like, just enrolling it and, and just, like, being part of it. And, I, like, um, I definitely, I think the biggest takeaway so far has been the sense of community. And, like, you don't have to go through this alone. Like you are not alone because everyone else has their own stuff that they're working through, but like being able to have a conversation about it and talk through things and, and just be able to speak it to someone and kind of like offload it and be like, Hey, do you have space for me right now? And kind of create that kind of relationship with someone is unlike anything that I've experienced. Um, but also too, like, learning how to be vulnerable around other people is something that I had never done. Like, I remember thinking when I was younger that even my best friends don't know who I am because I never let them in because that was scary. So like being able to have these kind of relationships now where I can just bear my entire soul to someone and have them be like, yeah, okay, that's valid. You know, these are some things you might want to work on, but you know, like you, what you're saying is, you know, I still love you. I still have space for you. I'll still hold space and speak it for you is like one of the most incredible things that I've experienced, I think, so far. I love that. And I see <clears throat> that already happening in the community that you're building too. And so I'd love to talk a little bit about um, your preparation for the PCT and your experience on the trail so far. Yeah. Um, so I started the PCT mid-March. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty slow hiker. I don't pretend to be that I'm this like super fat. Like I like to take my time with it. I have short legs. I move slow, like whatever it is what it is, but I'm realistic in what I do. So that yeah, works. Um, but like, I think there's so much talk about, you know, when you get on a trail, you're never going to be like truly alone because you're going to link up with people, um, which is true. But at the same time, I, I expected it to be kind of instant and it really wasn't um, because yes, I met people on trail, but they all just blew past me. Um, I had camped alone my first night, which is a, was a huge fear for me, but you know, day one, here we go. Here. Talk me, tell us about that. Like, so what was, what was your first day? Like, like, this is a dream that you've held at this point for years. You've paid mm -hmm. off your debt. You've saved up the money. You've acquired the gear. You're there. You're, you're, you are walking on the Pacific crest trail. What was that first day? Like, was it everything you dreamed of? And then some, was, like, how did it match up? It was like, it was super surreal. Um, because like you get to the terminus and you're just like, I expected this like Hollywood level moment of like seeing the terminus and just like touching it and bursting into tears and having this, like this emotional, like impact. You just, and in reality, I was like, well, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's the fence. That's bigger than I thought. Okay. Are we going yet? Like, <laughs> which was still kind of, kind of cool. Like you see, you know, they have people that host the terminus that like you sign in, they give you a spiel, they give you your little permit, a uh, little tag that you put on your pack. Um, and kind of like wish you luck. There you go. Okay, great. Um, so the first day I got to the terminus about, mm, I want to say eight or so, eight, eight thirty. probably was at the terminus for about an hour. Um, and then I started walking and it just felt like super surreal. And you're kind of like, this is APT. You see the signs and you're like, oh, this is cool. Um, and then like, excuse me, there was a water source about four and a half miles in, which is like a nice little shaded stream. It was really nice. So I had kind of stopped there to sit in the shade, get some water. And then like, I had met up with a couple other hikers and then we kind of sat there for about a half hour and then started going 
um, again. So we got there about, I got there about 12, left about 1230. If I could repeat that day, I would have stayed there a little longer um, and waited out the sun because the first four and a half miles felt fantastic. I felt super good. Um, like, this is, this is good. I feel great. My body feels good. Nothing hurts, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you start, you get out of the shade and you're starting walking in the high desert sun at noon. Not a good time. It just, it took me longer to do the three miles from the water source to camp than it took me to do the four and a half to get there in the morning. It was just brutally hot. And you're just, what the hell? Like, I've never had like an a switch like that, that I'm like, this feels great, dude, what the hell? Like, this is awful, so quickly, um, because it's just, uh, I don't know how to describe it, like, you feel like you're walking in a sauna, like, the heat is in your lungs, and you're just, it just, it's hot, and it, you know, the last mile was pretty rough, but, um, got to camp and was hoping that someone could stop and camp with me, but that didn't end up happening. But I mean, it worked out. So. Yeah. I love, I, I, as a resident of Southern California, who spent plenty of time hiking in desert like conditions, it's the worst. Like it is oppressively hot. It feels like you're sticking your face in an oven. Your water's hot. Your food is hot. Like everything's gross. Your sunscreen's runny, your chapstick's melty. It put it smeared all over your face. Maybe that's just me, but like, it's not fun. <laughs> and, and I think for, for a lot of people, especially for folks like of our generation, whatever that means to everybody, um, we're, we're being introduced to the culture of hiking and through hiking. And we're seeing these epic journeys documented on Instagram where we were starting to like form our own expectations around what this journey should be like for us. Like, I love, I love your reflection on what the terminus experience is like, because I too have pictured, like, I, <laughs> I, I, I think I want to through hike something after doing the Pema Jawasset loop and on the Appalachian trail last summer, I, uh, rethought my thought about that. Um, just because like so many of those hikers just looked completely dead in the eyes by the time they got to us. Um, and I, but I've had this like very, and I, I thank you, Reese Witherspoon. Um, I have this like thought of what I think this is going to be like, and it's going to be like, well lit with harps and stuff in the background. And so to affirm that that is not the experience <laughs> is, is, is both refreshing. And also like, I imagine we hold on to those visions to like hype ourselves up and ground us in this challenge that we're about to undertake. Like I imagine like losing the comfort of some of these expectations might've been jarring as well. Like not only are you throwing yourself into an environment that is the polar opposite of where you currently reside? Like you could not pick two more different geographic locations than New England mm -hmm. and Southern desert, California, like total opposites as far as like where the water is. There's so much water up here. It's insane. And there's no water down there. So yeah. I, how, like, what did you anticipate for your first night camping? And like, did you have a moment when you were laying there and you were just like, oh, this is different than what I thought it would be. Like, how did that feel for you? Um, yeah, it definitely, definitely felt different than what I thought it would. Um, I mean, the climate itself, like living in Colorado, which is technically a high desert, um, like I thought it would be kind of similar to that because, you know, hiking in Colorado, it's, it's really dry, it's pretty arid. Um, but you also have the luxury of the elevation where you're up, you know, a few thousand more feet. So it's a little bit cooler. Um, and um, yeah, setting up camp, like getting that stuff ready. Like I didn't expect to have the extremes so immediate. Like the daytime, you're so hot. And at night, you're so cold. Like I ended up having to swap out my sleeping bag because I wish it would wake up shivering and I had every piece of clothing I had on and I was still freezing. Um, but like, yeah, it's like you, you get to camp and you just drop everything. You're just like, I don't want to set up my camp because uh, it takes, you know, 
half hour, 45 minutes where you just dump everything. You're just like, I don't, I don't have the energy right now to do anything. Um, so yeah, I mean, granted, I, I mean, I've backpacked before. So it like the, the art of, um, setting up camp, breaking it down, having everything have, have, have a place, like you just, you get into this routine, which is, you know, it becomes second nature after a while, but like, I don't want to have to set up my tent. Like that's a lot of walking in circles. Like, I don't want to do that. So, <laughs> um, I think I went off topic a little bit. What was the question? Yeah, no, you're good. No, we were just talking about expectations and it, it sounds like that it just, it, you were just kind of like, okay, so th this is, this is what it is. Not the things that I might've thought in my mind or the things that I saw on Instagram or the things that I read about, like mm -hmm. I am squarely facing off with reality right now. And it's, and it's, and it's hard because that first night you spent alone. Yeah. Um, so talk to me about some of the stuff that you just absolutely loved about the first, uh, first week that you spent on the trail. Um, so <clears throat> because I camped alone the first night and really didn't see a lot of people, I mean, I met some people that kind of stopped at my campsite, but there really wasn't enough room for them to camp. So they ended up going like a half mile more and we had kind of stayed together for the first, like the next couple days. Um, but the second night I camped in Hauser Creek, which is at mile 15. Um, and then you, you go into like this Canyon and then the next, you know, couple miles is you're climbing out of the canyon into Lake Marina, which is the first town stop. Um, so when I got to Hauser Creek, there had people, there were people who had stopped there to kind of like wade out the sun a little bit. And I actually got to talk to people about like, how's your hike going? Like, and every single person that had come into camp was like, it's so hot. And it was like the first time that I would like commiserate with people because people would just blow past me. Um, and I'm the type of hiker that I just like, I get up in the morning and I like kind of just go. I haven't figured out the art of stopping and taking a break yet because it, it takes me a while to get going again. And I just don't like that, that um, phase of a hike just to keep going. But um like finally being able to talk to people and be like, oh, you're struggling too? Okay, it's hot for you too? Great, okay. So like your feet hurt, everything hurts for you too. It's not just me, it sucks for everyone, got it. Um, so like just this kind of sense of community that you kind of build with everybody because you're all going through the same thing at the same time, it's really kind of cool. I love that. Um, so, you're clearly not on the trail as we're doing this interview. So let's yeah. talk about what led you to get off the trail and then we'll go from there. So after I got to Lake Marina and had like the best milkshake of my life, it was fantastic. Um, I started the hike to uh, Mount Laguna, which is uh, probably 20 miles from Lake Marina to Mount Laguna. I ended up getting up to um mile 29 ish um and at this point I had been freezing for several nights in a row um and the trail up to Mount Laguna was another couple thousand feet of elevation gain and being so cold already I didn't think it was smart to go up in elevation as the you know storm, as storm was coming in didn't want to get stuck and risk hypothermia. So I ended up going back down to um, the campground uh, a little bit for past Lake Marina and hitching up to Julian um, to swap out a sleeping bag. So I stayed up in Julian for a couple of days, um, let my feet heal a little bit, uh, do some blister care, stuff my face with food and do some tongue stuff. Um, met up with someone in Julian who was going about my pace. Um, so we stayed there another night and then hiked out of Julian the following day. Um, and the hike out of Julian was, the terrain was like 
fairly straightforward. I mean, I come from the East Coast where things go straight up and then they go straight down. Um, whereas like on the West Coast, it's more kind of gradual switchbacks, nicely graded trail. Um, so the climbs are pretty nice. Um, but emotionally, I had a really hard time. We had gotten out of Scissors Crossing and I just started crying. And talking to my friend on trail, her name is Crunch. Um, and just thinking like, I don't know if through hiking is for me. I, I don't know why I'm feeling this way. I just, I don't know if I want to keep going. Um, so then we kind of talked about it for a few minutes. And then I was like, you know, let me, let me get through today. I will keep going. I'll see if I'm still feeling this way when we get to the next town and then I can figure it out. Um, and then the next day I would just randomly burst into tears on trail. We'd be walking and I would just stop and just sob for like three minutes and just be like, okay. Um, and then like keep going and then go to the next part and like sob for another five minutes and be, um, and was just not having a good time mentally. Like, um, I realized that, you know, through hiking might not be for me. I think I'd rather section hike it. Um, we're, you know, trying to figure this out. Still not feeling good. My feet hurt, everything hurt. Um, so then I got to the next town, which was Ranchita, and I ended up going home, um, flying home to Massachusetts. And when I got home, I um, had the realization that I started processing through the loss of my grandmother, which I lost, who I lost um, last month and was kind of telling myself that, you know, I didn't trust myself to not do something self-destructive um, because I was having some pretty intrusive thoughts about, yeah, I could just roll off this cliff here. It might be easier than keeping than continuing. And I was finding myself in a pretty dark spot, didn't really want to be there. Um, and in the week that I've been home and having some time to process through everything, I realized that I kind of, I just got scared and I punked out and was, uh, yeah, resorting to some old defense mechanisms of, yep, nope, I'm out. So. And I and had the privilege of talking to you before you came back home. And on the receiving mm -hmm. end of that conversation, what I heard was you were listening to your body. You were listening to your heart. And I do believe that all of those things were true. So I think, I don't think it's mm -hmm. an either or. I think it's a yes and. I think, yes, your expectations were different than what reality presented yes you were mourning the loss of your grandmother who had died just a, like the month prior to getting on the trail yes you were mm -hmm. having some intrusive thoughts girl same hi like i can't tell you how many hikes i've been where i've been walking <laughs> around like usually after usually it's like in between sobbing fits where i'm like really feeling down on myself and really just like spiraling and i've always been like especially in like bear territory or mountain lion territory i'm like if I got mauled by a bear and died, that wouldn't be the worst thing. It'd be easier than being alive, be easier than feeling these feelings. So like, <laughs> I feel you big time. And I, yeah. and I just, and I, and it was so, it was a really, it was a really beautiful moment. And I felt so honored to be able to hear you reflecting through that. And it was a big moment for me to be like, this is like, she's in it. And, and there's nothing that anybody could have said or done nor should there have been anything that anybody could have said or done. And so hearing, hearing you reflect back now and saying that you kind of punked out, like maybe you did, but also like you were, you were perhaps for the first time really listening to your body. And that's important to, to acknowledge as well. So I think like one of the things that I just love so much about how you got off the trail and now your realization about this is how it sounds like you got curious instead of judging yourself. Because if you were judging yourself, I don't think you'd get back on the trail. I think you'd convince yourself that you're not good enough or insert stupid reason here. Um, but you got curious about it. And so when we, before we started recording this podcast, you're like, I'm getting back on the trail. And I was like, wait a minute, what? So I want to hear about like, what, what led to this decision? Like you had the realization that 
you, th- you call it punking out. I call it yes. Anding yourself, like holding yourself accountable, but also honoring the growth that you did have. Um, so what, what, what makes you want to go back and, and what does that look like for you? No, absolutely. And, you know, I don't see, I don't call it punking out as anything derogatory. It's just an observation. Like, okay. We, exactly. We, we and that's what I mean. It was like and curiosity also, versus judgment. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think, um, the, the, for the last year or so I've done a lot of work on myself in terms of learning to listen to my body and I don't regret leaving trail because I know that was what I needed at the time. Like my feet were a mess. Everything hurt. I was like mentally done. Um, I needed some space from trail to kind of process through it all. Um, and I am glad that I kind of went home because I needed to be with my family. I needed to be around someone that like wasn't associated with the trail who would, you know, not judge me for anything. And I still made it to mile 100. Like I'm so freaking proud of myself. I've accomplished a lot. Um, but I think giving my, or the biggest thing I think in coming home and having this new perspective is I didn't come at myself at all with judgment. Like you said, getting curious, I showed myself a lot of kindness and was just like, you did it. You tried, you, you, it, you still accomplished a lot. You're not a failure. You still did it. You still did more than a lot of people could do. Like be proud of yourself. And that kind of gave my, gave me like a sense of grace to be like, yeah, okay, cool. Um, and then try and figure out what to do moving forward. Um, I think what kind of sparked this, like more curiosity of how like um, moving forward is, you know, I'm still in contact with a lot of people that I'm on trail and I've been talking to them and they are telling me like what's going on. And it's just like, I, I miss the trail. So um, I miss the people and I miss like uh, just the environment. So I am planning on going back on trail probably next month, May sometime, um, figure out how to get back on there. And then we're just going to, you know, take a little bit at a time and I'm not, I have no expectations and I just want to see what happens and, you know, probably going to try and do the last couple hundred of miles of the desert and then maybe tackle the part of the Sierra and just see how I'm feeling. And, um, yeah. Oh, I love that so much. And I'm so excited for you. And I'm really excited to like <laughs> come find you on a trail and do trail magic and bring you one of Barry's burritos. And it's just going to be so wonderful. I can't <laughs> wait. Um, but one of the things, so with aligning this, uh, series of the podcast, this season of the podcast to the different topics that we talk about and blaze your own trail to self-love, um, the, the week that I picked for you is week five, where we're talking about, we're now the first month of the program is finding inspiration and everything that our trail of life, as it were, has brought us so far, all the things we've survived, all the things we've celebrated and using that inspiration, like, oh my God, take a look in the rearview mirror. This is how much I've been through and I'm still here to then find ways to set intentions for our, our lives moving forward and moving through the program. And so week five, we're talking about what we call our goal setting uh, framework, which is your next summit. So like, what is the next summit that you want to reach? And to your point, (laughs) when we were first started talking about how you were like, oh, I do this one healing thing and then I'm done. And we've since realized like, this is a lifelong journey. Um, when When it comes to like your desire to either section hike or continue to through hike the Pacific Crest Trail, for this next section of trail, what are some of the things that you want to take with you how how do you want to feel while you're on the trail like because we we do get a choice like life throws us all kinds of things twists and turns ups and downs especially in the case of the like the literal trail like there's wilderness there's wild animals there's all kinds of unexpected things but i do believe that if we get grounded in how we want to feel while we're pursuing these goals that can really help guide our experience so what are some of the things that you want to feel while you're getting ready to return to the trail and, and once you get back on? Um, well, one of the things that I know that you and I had kind of talked about um, when I was in Julie and we had kind of had a conversation is, 
and I remember saying this to you that being on trail and being in this like frame of being um, is the closest that I've felt to myself than I ever have before. And like, I want to bring that with me. And like, this is because get, before getting on trail, I kind of saw the PCT as like this segment in time um, as the closing of this previous chapter and the beginning of the next one. So like, this is kind of like this connector sentence in my life where I kind of want to like, you know, get closer to the life that I want. Um, and feeling as close to myself now, like I know that that's possible. So like, I want to, you know, just be present in everything and understand that like, this is going to suck probably most of the time, but it's, it's the people that you surround yourself with and the experiences that you have that are shared that, you know, make the moment. Um, because I know that when I was getting ready to fly home from, um, before I left the trail, like I remember going through pictures and like already starting to romanticize the experience. And like, I know that that sucked so bad, but I'm like, but it was pretty. And look at this. And it's just like a tree and it's a cat, like and just romanticizing it in my head. I'm like, oh no. So <laughs> like knowing that that is eventually going to happen and that everything is temporary. Like I just need to, I want to be able to maintain that sense of, you know, yeah. Well, and I think, I think that's such a beautiful example of being able to find the good in a really sucky situation. Like, yes, romanticizing it, but also like you were able to rise above whatever feelings you might've been feeling around getting off the trail and be like, all of that is true. And also this beauty is true. So I think that that's, that's a really cool, mm -hmm. um, trait that you carry. And I don't, I don't, I don't think that there's anything wrong with romanticizing it because that's what keeps us going, right? Like that's that's what keeps us going through life. Because if we just if we just saw the suck in everything, like why the heck would we still be here? There's a lot of stuff suck to see. Mm -hmm. It's nice to be able to find the pockets of beauty. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. um last question that I have for you before we wrap up today. Um, in the context of the work that you're doing with plus size outdoors and your mission um, to raise awareness for everything that you stand for and all the things that are important to you. If you had a magic wand and you could just like wave it and something would happen, um, what would that be? Like, would you instill some kind of understanding amongst the general population about a thing? Or is there something that's been weighing heavy on your mind or heart that you wish more people could just understand or a behavior that you wish that they would stop doing what would your magic wand do and you could use it on yourself too you don't have to do this to benefit society so what would you do with your magic wand and and what would those benefits um look like hmm. um that's like a heavy question oh man um i feel like i would remove judgment and stereotypes from things like just because someone looks a certain way doesn't mean that they're you know all the descriptive stereotypes that they are seen as in society um and just remove like judgment and being like oh you can't do that because of x y and z or like oh my gosh you're so amazing because you're doing this like one thing that everyone else is doing but you're focusing on me like one of the, the most beautiful things that I've experienced so far on trail is like on day hikes or on like shorter backpacking trips, you know, I get the, oh, you're doing great. Oh, you're saying like, it's so great to see people like you on the trail where like, you know, someone who's living in a fat body. Okay. But you know, I'm with all these people that you're not saying this stuff to which, you know, I understand the intention behind it, but like, you don't need to vocalize this, you know, stigma that you have or this bias in you, ha you have. Um, but on the trail, like on the PCT, I've seen like, I'm just another hiker. Like, like there really isn't, I don't know how to describe it. Like, it's just, 
they, like there's no like people aren't thinking oh you're such an inspiration because like you're you know you're fat blah 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 no it's just I'm doing this and people are like, oh that's cool hey nice to meet you have a good time like it's I don't know how to describe it but it's like one of I the most wholesome and amazing things that I've experienced I think there's something really special about finding community centered around something like a shared activity. I found this in skydiving immediately. And I met, especially when we moved to Southern California and Barry was running the school at um, Skydive Elsinore and I was running events and marketing and I was also a competitor training at that drop zone. We saw so many people from all over the world. Like it was, it was a world destination drop zone. And we didn't, we weren't looking at political ideologies. We weren't judging people for where they came from, what language they spoke, who they voted for, any of that. It was just, we're here because we love jumping out of planes. And I think that there's something mm -hmm. really intense about the bonds that we create. And it's hard for people who haven't done something like skydiving or like through hiking, where this is something that bucks societal norms. This is something where we are throwing ourselves out of our comfort zones, especially as people living in America. Um, and with regards to through hiking, like we are actively choosing something that most people live that where it isn't a choice. Like it's based, it's essentially forced homelessness and migration that's glorified and, and beautified. And I think that there's something really beautiful about sharing experiences with people where in a lot of cases it can be, and often is life and death. Like you are reliant on yourself a hundred percent, but also the people around you, like this is a community. We don't want to see anybody get injured. We don't want to see anybody get hurt or have a, an emotional breakdown on the trail. Like we want to support that. And I think that there's just something so magical about that. And I wish that that was something that more of humanity could experience. Like, I wish we could bottle up that level of understanding and community and curiosity and just outright respect because to your point you're like i'm out here but so is this guy like we're all here for the same reason and there's a mutual respect because we've all done whatever we had to do to make it to this trail to be able to have this experience so i just love i love living this trail through you because i haven't done a big through hike like that yet like i've hiked across michigan we did a big hike around chicago but i haven't done anything remotely close to what you're about to take on as as your next endeavor so um you're just you're incredible you inspire me because of who you are and what you do um and thank i thank you is there is there anything that i haven't asked or that you would like to share um before we before we wrap up for today um i think like the, the closing message that i would like to leave with with everyone is like you get to define yourself and who you are and to steal a line from your playbook is you get to define what success looks like for you. Um, that has been life changing for me, Sydney. So thank you. Um, <laughs> is that if you want to go hike, go on a hike. If you want to go whatever, like do whatever you want. I mean, within reason. Um, yeah, like, but like, no murder. Don't let any, no, no murder. I mean, mm, yeah, we'll leave that one there. Um, <laughs> Um, but if you want to go, go do something and if it's your life dream to go do something, go do it. Life is too short to live in someone else's boundaries of what your life can look like. Just, yeah, realize that you are enough as you are completely and you have the right to take up space. And if you want to go into this, you know, niche thing that people who are in it don't necessarily look like you go do it make space for yourself and take it up because like you're worth it so yeah ba, 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 ba. <laughs> mic drop <laughs> <laughs> confetti cannons <laughs> <laughs> yes, make that space and take it up because you are worth it. Victoria, I can't think of a better note to end on. For everybody that's listening um, who wants to get involved, where can they find you and how can they support your work? I am on Instagram at plus underscore sized underscore size with a D um, outdoors and on YouTube at plus sized outdoors. Um, and then my website is plus sized outdoors.org. Fantastic. Victoria, thank you so much for being here. 
I hope that by the time this airs, we're listening to it on a campground somewhere on the Pacific Crest Trail, eating delicious burritos and just absolutely yeah. crushing our uh, your next section of the PCT. So thank you for being here. And for everybody that's listening, uh, go follow Victoria, cheer her on, leave some words of encouragement, and uh, we'll see you out there on the trail. All right, thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. If you're curious about how to make your next hike a bit more mindful, visit hikingmyfeelings.org slash subscribe to download our free trail thoughts worksheets.